Hey guys, this is Bjorn Joshi with Superior North. Welcome back to my channel. Today, we will be talking about a stock that was talked about in one of the recent Barron's newspaper. That stock is called Deer & Company. In this video, we will be talking about the company's business by going over its annual report, then review the company's fundamentals by going over its key ratios, and finally find the intrinsic value of the company. So let's dive in and review Deer & Company. Hey guys, let's start off by looking at the Form 10K, which is the annual report that Deer & Company filed with the SEC. This is for the fiscal year that ended October 31st, 2021. On page 3 of the report, the company starts off by talking about its business. In the fiscal year 2021, Deere and & Company and its subsidiaries collectively John Deere implemented a new operating model and reporting structure. And as a result, John Deere's operations are now characterized into four major business segments. The first is the production and precision agriculture segment, which defines, develops, and delivers equipment and technology solutions to unlock customer value for production-scale growers of large grain, small grain, cotton, and sugar. The segment's main products include large and certain mid-sized tractors, combines, cotton pickers, sugarcane harvesters and loaders, and soil preparation, seeding, application, and crop care equipment. The second segment is the small agriculture and turf segment, which defines, develops, and delivers global equipment and technology solutions to unlock customer value for dairy and livestock producers, high-value crop producers, and turf and utility customers. The segment's main products include certain mid-sized and small tractors, as well as hay and forage equipment, riding and commercial lawn equipment, golf course equipment, and utility vehicles. The third business segment is the construction and forestry segment, which defines, develops, and delivers a broad range of machines and technology solutions organized along the earth-moving, forestry, and road-building production systems. The segment's primary products include crawler dozers and loaders, four-wheel drive loaders, excavators, skid steer loaders, milling machines, and log harvesters. The fourth and last operating segment is its financial services segment, which primarily finances sales and leases by John Deere dealers of new and used production and precision agriculture, small agriculture and turf, and construction and forestry equipment. The company points out that John Deere's worldwide production and precision agriculture operations, small agriculture and turf operations, and construction and forestry operations are sometimes collectively referred to as the equipment operations, and the financial services segment is sometimes referred to as the financial services operations. Now let's go to page 30 to get a better idea of the revenue breakdown across these segments. Over here, the company points out that its worldwide production and precision agriculture operations for the year 2021 had a net sales of about $16.5 billion. This was an increase of 27% since 2020 sales. Similarly, the company's operating profit saw a growth in the year 2021 as well, and the company's operating margin was higher. The operating margin is simply the ratio of the company's operating profit to the net sales, Ideally, we want the company's operating margin to be growing, as that means that the company is becoming more efficient with its operations. John Deere explains that the segment sales increased due to higher shipment volume and price realization. Operating profit benefited from price realization, higher shipment volume, sales mix, and a favorable indirect tax ruling in Brazil. These items were partially offset by higher production costs. The prior year was also impacted by employee separation program expenses. Next, the company provides us this graph about what led to the growth in the company's operating profit numbers. Back in 2020, the number was about $1.9 billion. Due to the company's volume and price realizations, there was a growth, and there were certain subtractions such as production costs and warranty, which eventually led to the company's 2021 operating profit number of $3.3 billion. The second operating segment is its small agriculture and turfs operations segment, which for the year 2021 had a net sales of about $11.86 billion. This was a growth of about 27% since the previous year. Similarly, the company's operating profit almost doubled to about $2 billion, which was a growth of about 105%. And lastly, the company's operating margin grew from about 10.7 to 17.2%. Similar to the previous segment, the company explains that the segment sales and operating profit were both higher in 2021 due to higher shipment volume, sales mix, and price realization. The operating profit improvement was partially offset by higher production costs. Results of the current year were positively impacted by a gain on the sale of a factory in China, while results of the prior year were affected by impairments, closure costs, and employee separation expenses. In other words, the company is saying that 2020 already had depressed results due to all these expenses and costs, and 2021 saw a growth not only in the top-line numbers but also due to the sale of the factory in China. Similar to the previous graph over here, the company shows what led to the growth in the company's small agriculture and turf operating profit numbers. Back in 2020, the segment's operating profit was about $1 billion. There was growth in the company's operating profit due to the volume, price realization, currency fluctuations, and special items. 
There were certain costs such as warranty, production costs, R&D, and others, which eventually led to the company's operating profit number to about $2 billion. The third operating segment is its worldwide construction and forestry operations segment. Back in 2021, the company's net sales amounted to about $11.4 billion, which is a growth of about 27% since the previous year. The operating profit grew by about 152%, and the operating margin grew from about 6.6% to 13.1%. Similar to the previous segments, the worldwide construction and forestry operation segment sales increased in 2021 primarily due to higher shipment volumes and price realization. Operating profit increased primarily due to positive shipment volume, sales mix, and price realization, partially offset by higher production costs. The prior year was also impacted by employee separation program expenses and impairments in certain fixed assets and unconsolidated affiliates. Next, the company provides us this graph where it shows how the, back in 2020, the company's construction and forestry operating profit number was about $590 million. There was a growth in this number due to the company's increased volume, price, special items, and others. There were certain costs such as currency fluctuations, warranty, production costs, and R&D, which eventually led to the company's 2021 operating profit number for the construction and forestry segment to be about $1.5 billion. The company's fourth and last operating segment is its worldwide financial services operations. Back in 2021, the company's revenue was about $3.7 billion, which was a decline of about 2% from the previous year. The segment's interest expenses dropped by about 27%. However, the segment's net income grew by about 56%. John Deere explains that while the average balance of receivables and leases finance was 5% higher in 2021, revenue decreased due to lower average interest rates. Interest expenses decreased in 2021 as a result of lower average borrowing rates. Net income in 2021 increased primarily due to an improvement on operating lease residual value, a lower provision for credit losses, more favorable financing spreads, and income earned on higher average portfolio. Next, the company provides us this graph of its financial services net income numbers. Back in 2020, the company's financial services net income was about $600 million dollars and it grew to about $900 million in the year 2021 due to a growth in its average portfolio, the spread, the operating gains, provision for credit losses, and others. Next, the company breaks down its revenue and profit numbers based on the geographic locations, that is, whether it's in the United States and Canada or outside the United States and Canada. In the year 2021, the company's net sales and revenue inside the United States and Canada amounted to about $26 billion. This was a growth of about 21% since the previous year. Similarly, the company's U.S. and Canada operations saw a growth in its operating profit and operating margin as well. Next, the company's net sales outside the United States and Canada amounted to about $18 billion in the year 2021. This was a growth of about 29% compared to the previous year. The operations outside the United States and Canada also saw a growth in its operating profit and operating margin numbers. Now that we have a brief understanding of the company's business, its four operating segments and its revenue breakdown, let's review the company's fundamentals by focusing on its key ratios. Hey guys, now let's look at the key ratios. I'm on Morningstar looking at Deere and Company. Under key ratios, we have the financials. The first item on the list is the revenue. The revenue is the top line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that the company brings in via sales. Back in 2012, the company's revenue was about $36 billion. After that, we saw a decline over the upcoming years where the revenue dropped down to about $26 billion in 2016. And ever since then, the company's revenue has been trending upwards. For the year 2021, the company's revenue was about $44 billion. Next is the operating income. The operating income is the amount of money that's left with the company once we subtract the cost of goods and operating expenses from the company's revenue. Back in 2012, the company's operating income was about $4.7 billion. And similar to the company's revenue, the company's operating income trended downwards all the way to about 2016 when it got to about $2.2 billion. And ever since then, the company's operating income has been trending upwards. For the year 2021, the company's operating income was about $7.5 billion. Next is the operating margin. The operating margin is the ratio of the company's operating income to its revenue. In other words, this number gives an idea of every $100 that the company makes, how much money is left over once it pays for the cost of goods and operating expenses. Back in 2012, the company's operating margin was about 13.1%, and for the train 12 months, that number was about 17.2%. Ever since 2016, the company's operating margin has been trending upwards. And we certainly want to see a trend like this as when a company's operating margin grows, that tells us that the company is becoming more efficient with its operations. Finally, looking at the net income, the net income is the bottom line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that's left with the company once it pays for the cost of goods, operating expenses, non-operating expenses, interest on its debt obligations, and taxes. Back in 2012, the company's net income was about $3 billion. 
and for the trying 12 months, that number had grown to about $6 billion. Ideally, we wanted the company's net income, operating income, and revenue numbers to be staying steady or increasing. And we can see that for John Deere, the company's net income, operating income, and revenues have been growing ever since 2016. There was a unique year in 2020 where the company reported lower revenue numbers compared to the previous year. This was primarily due to the pandemic. And that is the reason why the company's revenue, operating income, and net income numbers were depressed in the year 2020. Next is the dividends per share. Back in 2012, the company paid out about $1.79 per share as dividend. And for the year 2021, it was about $3.61 per share as dividend. Over the past 10 years, John Deere has been consistently paying out dividends, and it has even hiked its dividends a few times over the past 10 years. After that, looking at the shares outstanding, back in 2012, the company had 402 million shares outstanding. And for the trailing 12 months, that number had dropped to about 314 million shares outstanding. Over the past 10 years, the company has been buying back its shares as the share count has been going down. This is good news for existing shareholders as when a company buys back its shares, it actually helps increase the existing shareholders' ownership within the company. Lastly, the consistent and increasing dividend payouts and the share buybacks indicate that the management is shareholder friendly. Next is the book value per share. The book value is what we get when we subtract the company's total liabilities from its total assets. In other words, book value is shareholders' equity. Back in 2012, the company's book value was about $17.64 per share, and for the trailing 12 months, that number had grown to about $59.8 per share. Over the past 10 years, the company's book value per share has always been positive and increasing. This tells us that first, the company always had more assets than liabilities on its balance sheet, and secondly, the proportion of the company's assets compared to its liabilities is growing. Finally, looking at the free cash flow, the free cash flow is what we get when we subtract the company's capital spending from its operating cash flow. Back in 2012, the company had a negative free cash flow because its capital spending exceeded its operating cash flow. In 2013, the company's free cash flow was about $879 million. And for the year 2021, it was $5,146 million. Ideally, we wanted the company's free cash flows to be positive, staying steady or increasing. I will be using the 2021 free cash flow number of $5,146 million from a discounted free cash flow DCF analysis. Now let's look at the profitability of the company, focusing on the net margin. The net margin is the ratio of the company's bottom line to its top line, so it compares the company's net income to its revenue. Back in 2012, the company's net margin was about 8.52%, and for the trailing 12 months, that number was about 13.68%. What this means is every $100 that the company made over the past 12 months, by the time it paid for its cost of goods, operating expenses, non-operating expenses, interest on its debt obligations, and taxes, it had $13.68 left as pure profit. Ideally, we wanted the company's net margin numbers to be positive, staying steady or increasing. And we can see that the company's net margin numbers have been growing ever since 2018. Next is the return on equity. The return on equity compares the company's net income to its shareholders' equity. Warren Buffett refers to only invest in securities that have a return on equity of 8% or greater every year for the past 10 years. Back in 2012, the company's return on equity was about 45%. And for the trailing 12 months, that number was about 38%. The three ways a company can report high return on equity numbers is first when it reports higher income numbers, second is when it takes on more debt, that is when it takes on more liabilities, and third is when the company buys back its shares, it can report higher return on equity numbers. In fact, all those reasons apply as to why John Deere has high return on equity numbers. Finally, looking at the return on invested capital, this number gives an idea of how good the management is at allocating the company's capital and getting a return on that investment. Back in 2012, the company's return on invested capital was about 8.43%. And for the trailing 12 months, that number was about 9.44%. John Deere's weighted average cost of capital, also known as the company's hurdle rate, is about 5.07%. And since the company's return on invested capital is greater than its weighted average cost of capital, we can safely say that the management is creating value for its shareholders. Now let's look at the financial health and liquidity ratios. The first item on the list is the current ratio. The current ratio compares the company's current assets to its current liabilities. Ideally, we want the company's current ratio to be greater than 1.0. It's even better if it's greater than 1.5. A current ratio greater than 1.0 tells that the company has enough assets to fulfill its liabilities over the next 12 months. Back in 2012, the company's current ratio was at 2.14, and for the latest quarter, it's at 2.09. Next is the quick ratio. The quick ratio is similar to the current ratio except we disregard the inventory component. In other words, quick ratio is equal to current assets minus inventory divided by current liabilities. Ideally, we want the company's quick ratio to be greater than 1.0, as that tells us that the company does not have to rely on selling its inventory in order to fulfill its current liabilities. Back in 2012, the company's quick ratio was at 1.87, and for the latest quarter, it's at 1.85. John Deere's current and quick ratios over the past 10 years indicate that the company was never in a liquidity bind. That is, the company always had enough assets to fulfill its liabilities. 
Next is the financial leverage. The financial leverage compares the company's total assets to shareholders' equity. A high financial leverage tells us that more of the company's assets are financed via liabilities. Back in 2012, the company's financial leverage was at 8.22, and for the latest quarter, it's at 4.56. Ideally, we want the company's financial leverage to be staying steady or decreasing, and John Deere's financial leverage has been trending downwards ever since 2016. Finally, looking at the debt to equity ratio, this ratio compares the company's total debt to its shareholders' equity. Ideally, we want the company's debt to equity ratio to be less than 1.0. Back in 2012, the company's debt to equity was at 3.28, and for the latest quarter, it's at 1.78. The company's debt to equity ratio, similar to the company's financial leverage, has also been trending downwards ever since 2016. John Deere's financial leverage and debt to equity ratios are comparable to those of its competitors, such as Caterpillar. Now, let's look at the efficiency ratios. The first item on the list is the day sales outstanding number. This number gives an idea of how many days go by from the day the company recognizes its sales to the day it actually receives cash for that service rendered. Back in 2012, the company's day sales outstanding was about 36 days, and for the train 12 months, that number was about 35 days. Ideally, we want the company's day sales outstanding number to be staying steady or decreasing. What we do not want to see is a company whose day sales outstanding number is growing rapidly, as that tells us that the company's management is being aggressive with its accounting, as it's recognizing its revenue sooner so that it can inflate its income numbers on its income statement. However, John Deere's management does not appear to be playing any such accounting tricks as its day sales outstanding numbers have stayed fairly consistent over the past 10 years. Next is the day's inventory. This number gives an idea of how many days does John Deere's products sit in its inventory before they are sold. Back in 2012, the company's day's inventory was about 67 days. And for the train 12 months, that number was about 71 days. Ideally, we want the company's day's inventory number to be staying steady or decreasing. What we do not want to see is a company whose inventory just lingers around on its balance sheet. We rather see that inventory being pushed onto the income statement and be realized as a profit number. Finally, looking at the payables period, this number gives an idea of how many days does the company take to pay its suppliers. Back in 2012, the company took about 31 days to pay its suppliers. And for the training 12 months, that number was about 29 days. Over the past 10 years, the company's payables period has stayed fairly consistent. What we do not want to see is a company whose payables period is growing rapidly as that tells that the company's management is holding on to its cash in order to artificially inflate its cash flow numbers. However, John Deere's management does not appear to be playing any such accounting tricks to inflate its cash flow numbers. Now let's review the company's current valuation. The first item on the list is the price to earnings ratio. Deere and company's price to earnings is at 19.4. The company's price to book is at 6.2. The company's price to sales is at 2.7. The company's price to cash flow is at 15.0 and the company has a dividend yield of 1.1%. When we compare the company's current valuation to its five-year average, we can see that based on the price to earnings and price to cash flow metrics, the company is undervalued. Similarly, if we compare the company's current valuation to the S&P 500, and S&P 500 is the aggregate of the top 500 companies in the United States, then we can think of investing in the S&P 500 as our opportunity cost. When we compare the company's current valuation to the S&P 500, we can see that based on the price to earnings, price to sales, and price to cash flow metrics, the company is currently undervalued compared to the S&P 500. Now let's look at the company's discounted free cash flow DCF analysis. Over here, I pasted the company's 2021 free cash flow number that I got from Morningstar, which was at $5,146 million. I'm assuming the company's annual growth rate to be 9%. What this means is I expect the company's free cash flow to grow at 9% every year for the next 10 years. I'm using a discount rate of 10%. What this means is I want this investment to give me a 10% return. In other words, I want to double my investment in about 7 years. I'm using the company's long-term growth rate to be 2.242%. What this means is after the 10-year mark into perpetuity, I expect the company's free cash flow to grow at 2.242%. This number is in line with the U.S. 30-year Treasury yield. Next, Deere and Company has 314 million shares outstanding and has a long-term debt of $32,848 million. After taking all of these inputs into account, we get the company's intrinsic value to be about $246.64 per share. And when we compare this intrinsic value to the company's current stock price, which is about $369 per share, we can see that the company's current stock is trading about 1.5 times its intrinsic value. The way we come up with this intrinsic value is we look at what the free cash flows would be every year for the next 10 years. We sum up all those free cash flows, which come out to about $49 billion. Then we look at what the free cash flows would be after the 10-year mark into perpetuity. We sum all these up to get the intrinsic value to be about $110 billion. From this number, we subtract the long-term debt and divide by the shares outstanding to get the intrinsic value per share to be about $246.64. If you disregard the perpetuity component, in other words, if you think that John Deere is only going to grow for the next 10 years and then it'll cease to exist, 
Then we get the intrinsic value without the perpetuity to be about $51 per share. If we disregard the debt, in other words, if we think that John Deere is going to grow into perpetuity, so there is no point for the company to worry about paying off its debt, then we get the intrinsic value without the debt to be about $351 per share. Finally, let's try to figure out what kind of return can we expect to get if you were to invest in this company at the current stock price. And in order to find the discount rate, we are going to run a gold seek analysis. We'll set our sell, which is our intrinsic value, to the company's current stock price, which is $369.10 per share. And we'll run this analysis by changing the discount rate. So at the end, it turns out that if you were to invest in the security at the current stock price of about $369 per share, we can expect to get an annual return of about 8.2% on this investment. Overall, John Deere has good fundamentals and the company is continuously innovating as they unveiled an autonomous tractor in January at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. The new tractor can save both time and labor as it does not need a driver in the cab to operate. Additionally, the tractor can operate at all hours because it runs on a predetermined course with limited obstacles. Lately, people are concerned about inflation and John Deere is one of those companies that can pass on those inflationary pressures, those price increases, higher material costs onto their end users because those end users are commodity-like producers such as soybean and corn. And those producers, as the prices of commodities go up, can easily buy machinery that is more technologically advanced than before. Lastly, we saw that when we use a 10% discount rate, the company's current stock price is trading at a premium to its intrinsic value. Additionally, the company operates in the industrial sector, which is cyclical to the U.S. economy. So with the rise and fall in the company's earnings, the company's stock price is going to fluctuate as well. Hey guys, that is all I had for you this week. Hopefully you found this video on Deere and Company interesting. If you like this content, please do like, share, comment, and subscribe. And if you have any suggestions on which stock I should view next, please leave it in the comment section below. I'll greatly appreciate it. Thank you.